Hello, and welcome to Making Sense of It. I am Mona Duncan, your moderator. Uh, do you ever wonder why you do the things you do? Well, then this program is for you. This is our gift to you from the Glasser Institute for Choice Theory, where each week we have a certified member of the Glasser Institute that presents a concept that they have been using and the results that comes forth from it. Um, our speaker today we, is returning again with us, uh, Robert Martin, and he has been going through his book, Connect and Involve, and we are currently on chapter seven, which is Motivation Follows Action. So uh, we have others that have just joined us, and it's good to have you with us. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, welcome. And Robert, hello. How are you? Hello, and thank you for the invitation. I can't believe this is already the seventh presentation and discussion that we will be having. So uh, that's quite a that's quite amazing. So uh, thank you. Yeah, and we're ready when you are. So take it away. Okay, so I have to share my screen. Uh, which is uh, pressing a bunch of buttons and uh, pressing more buttons and okay, still more. It, it's ah, uh, there we go. There we go. Yay, okay. mission accomplished. Okay, good. So this is on, uh, Mona kind of already gave away the big secret here. So uh, <laughs> so this is about motivation. The thing about motivation is that um, I want to talk mainly about working with students and helping to get students motivated. But I also want to take a talk about all of us because the more we practice on ourselves, then the more we can practice with others. And I think I've found this very much with choice theory and reality therapy and uh, as, as well as when you practice on yourself and with yourself, then it's much easier to use the ideas with other people. So, uh, so first things first, why aren't people motivated? I originally had, well, why aren't students motivated? But so, no, let's talk about everybody because we're all involved with this and this applies to everybody uh, regardless of the situation that you're in. And, and I don't know if you can see the cat down at the bottom here. It's like the cat is under the de desk sleeping as cats are wont to do. And um, yeah, I mean, the cat is motivated to sleep, I guess. Okay, so the first thing is that as teachers and as students, we feel, and as a, and just human beings, we feel mode, emotional resistance to doing anything that we don't want to tackle. And why is it we don't want to tackle something? Um, and what can we do about it? Well, the first thing is we tend to wait until we feel motivated. I just don't feel motivated today. As soon as I feel a little motivation, then I'll do something. Uh, and the students, of course, feel the same way. Well, what we wanna do is to turn this on its head and to say, if you wanna feel motivated, take action. In the same way, get students to take an action, no matter how simple it is and get them to take actions one step at a time. So the big thing about beginning a task that seems difficult is that uh, it seems difficult because it's above our threshold of resistance. In other words, resistance is, as soon as we feel resistance, there's this little kind of thing of fear. It's like, well, maybe I can't do this. I don't want to do it, et cetera, et cetera. So tasks need to be below the threshold of resistance, at least to begin with. So how do we know a task is below the threshold of resistance? Well, if it seems too easy to you, if you feel insulted, oh, that's way too easy, 
then that's an indication you're on the right track. That's the, that's the place to begin. And that's the place to begin with students as well, uh, is to pick something so easy that it's like, oh, that's, that's so ridiculous. I can certainly do that. And then you do it and then you can get into other things. So the idea is to turn motivation on its head. You take a small action, you feel motivated, and then you're moved to complete the, uh, the task, whatever it is. And not all, all the time, but this is a good, this is the best idea that I know regarding motivation. So let's just go through a bunch of strategies that lead to motivation, whether it's for yourself or you're working with others. It could be employees, it could be students, uh, could be your own children, um, grown or, not grow, doesn't matter. And so number one is just to review, choose what's too easy to begin with. Uh, and that can take a little bit of, of work. Just to give you an example, one of the things that I did is, uh, in counseling in the public school is, uh, as Dr. Glasser used to say is like, well, they never send you the good kids, the kids who are doing really well. They send you the kids who, who are having problems and say, here, fix this kid. And so there, uh, and as he pointed out, there are only two problems uh, that kids have. It's like they're either not getting along or uh, with others, either the kids, other kids or the teacher, or they're not doing their work. So when they're not doing their work, it's generally because they're, they're, uh, they're discouraged. So one of the things, for example, with reading, uh, kids would, would feel like, oh, gee, uh, oh, I can't read. I'm not reading, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, okay, I'm not good. Well, but I'm going to try to talk them into uh, reading. It's like, no, everybody else has failed at doing this. So I used to have these things called more Bob books, which are were very simple books, which Basically, you can read if you're a kindergarten or first grader. And sometimes they did work with first graders, but mostly older kids, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade. And so, so I'd give them one of these and say, oh, well, uh, let, let's just go through this. And even the worst readers, they could make it through the, this. And then I would say to them, it's like, oh, oh, gee, that's really interesting. I guess you can read uh, better than you, you, you can read. You can read better than you thought you could. So I'm trying to get them to change their concept of themselves by showing them they can do something that they think they can't do. And I'm not pointing out that it's easy. We're just doing it. So we don't necessarily want to have an easy button. We just reintroduce something when we get people going. And the same way with truth. Math, I'd have, have kids who were failing in math and they've given up, I can't do math. Um, it's like, here, fix this kid, he can't do it, he won't do me. Well, why are they sending to, to me since I'm a psychologist, I'm counseling with them, but nevertheless, to get them to work in school, I sometimes would have to do a little bit of tutoring. So we'd say, oh, well, let's see, can you count by twos? Well, oh, let's try that. And if they got up to 10, it's like, okay, well, let's go a little more. And generally, I, if I could, I'd get them up to 100. It's like, oh, wow. Okay, well, you, you did the twos up to 100. Well, yeah. And if there were older kids, we might try threes or whatever. And that was like, that would take some thinking. But if they could do it, that was, that was a great thing. And again, help them to change their idea of themselves. So motivation is has to do with fear and resistance, but also our concept of ourselves. So leading on from there is breaking tasks into bite-sized chunks. And of course, this is great for ourselves as well. You start out with a big task, break it into small pieces. And I can tell you, uh, writing a paper, whether it's, a hundred words or 50,000 words, I fin finished this book that I'll tell you about at the end. Uh, it doesn't matter, you wanna break it into, into steps. 
So with me, I have a terrible time clear getting my desk clear. And uh, I try to always have it clear, but usually it isn't. If it gets too full, then I have to make a deal. It's like, okay, every time I pass the desk during the day, I will focus on, I will deal with, I'll pick up one piece of paper and I'll deal with that. Or with my emails, it's like, okay, I'll deal with a couple of emails. Uh, uh, I'll deal with the easiest ones in the morning and then, and then I'll deal with a few that are a month old because, oh, this is hard and it was just difficult. Okay, number three is get limited commitments. This is great for yourself, but it's also great with adults or kids. It doesn't matter. I love 10 minute commitments because it's like, okay, well, could we just do this for 10 minutes? Or would you be willing to do this for 10 minutes? And then if it's somebody who's a little older, uh, after 10 minutes, they're fine with it. And uh, they can even, they will even keep going. So you don't say, oh, stop, <laughs> you've, you've done 10 minutes. It's like, no, if they want to continue, it's like, or if I want to continue, it's like, I just have to get myself started. It's like, oh, I'm so tired today. I can't, I can't work out. Well, I'll just do 10 minutes. Once I'm into it, then it's like, yeah, I, I tend to keep going. Maybe it's only 15, but that's still 15 more minutes than I would have done. Now, what if 10 minutes is too much? We'll get a five minute commitment, get, get a one minute commitment. Uh, either from yourself or from the student, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. So when our kids were really small, we would, uh, the way I would teach them to te put their toys away is it's like, well, let's put the toys away. And we had a box or whatever. And it's like, I would pick up a toy, I would hand it to them and then they would drop it in the box. And I would keep handing them till we pretty much got, got that finished. So it was like, uh, a limited commitment from them. Uh, I was handing it to them. They were taking the action. I didn't try to make them do it. Number four is you got to adjust the expectations and the work to fit what the person can do. Uh, my, I'll give an example of my son who, okay, he had great trouble physically writing. And I remember when he was thir in third grade, he just couldn't keep up with, with the physical aspect of writing. He understood everything and he could do it all, but he couldn't keep up with the physical aspect of writing. He, he was beginning to show some really neurotic behavior. I mean, he would come home on Friday and he's already worried about going back to school on Monday. It's like, oh, this, this is bad. I better go ahead and talk to the teacher. Well. The teacher was very defensive. It was kind of like, I know you're a psychologist. Blah, blah, blah. It's like, I didn't respond to that. I just said, okay, well, look, you know, here's this problem. And, you know, I mean, I, under I understand that you want him to do the same, but, you know, it's like he's left handed. He was premature. He's a boy. These are typical things why uh, younger children in this case, a third grader, don't have the physical dexterity uh, of uh, sometimes of, of other students in the class. They just haven't developed that yet. And so finally, and I just listened and with very patient, finally she said, well, what do you want me to do? Just give him less. I said, I don't want you to give him any less than he's capable of doing, but if he's working hard and he does three in the time that other people do five, well, um, I would say that's, that's fine. Uh, the main thing is I'm seeing this problem of him getting so worried at night and, and worried on Friday about going back on Monday. So, uh, you know, I'm seeing this neurotic behavior. I don't want him to give up. So she finally adjusted her expectations, which was really hard for her because it was like, well, that's not fair if he gets to die. I said, well, hey, if he's working hard, you know, hey, I'm not, I don't want you to let him get by with anything, but if he's working as hard as he can, then uh, 
we, we can adjust to what he's able to do. Uh, by the way, uh, he did graduate from college uh, in physics. He worked for uh, a number of NASA um, people uh, uh, who, who had contra NASA contractors and he now works for Boeing. So he hasn't done so badly. Uh, he he managed that. He managed to uh, get a degree in physics and get a master's degree in rocket science. So not too bad. Okay, take short breaks. Short breaks in, increase productivity, and and uh, you know that's good for all of us. You know, uh, it it really works well, and it works well for kids too. And it can be a short break, just having them do something, just stand up and stretch or, and then sit back down, whatever you, whatever you think is appropriate. And the same way with employees, it's like, it's good to take a, a, a very short break and, and come back. Change, a change of activities is like a break. So if you can change activities often enough for yourself or your students, uh, uh, with others, then uh, you actually get more more done, and that's something I really like like to do. For me, uh, I get tired. It's like okay, uh, we kind of share the work around house, so it's like I'll go and uh, load the dishwasher or empty the dishwasher or something like that, or I'll put some paper away or whatever it happens to do. And the same way with with uh, students. If you change the activities uh, often enough, uh, then that works really well. Okay, seven, use social rewards. Social rewards meet basic needs better than physical rewards. You can have stu people, uh, students show that, share their products and their performances with others, you can recognize the performance or the product praise the performance, recognize what's good about the performance or the product, don't praise the person because that tends to cause uh, problems and that's been written about elsewhere, we won't go into that. Celebrate progress in students learning the big ideas and the key skills. Hey, we just really went on, and that's a good, a good uh, way of reminding students, it's like, hey, we just did something important. We just went through a big idea or we just practiced a, a, a key skill that's really important in this, in this class and that's really gonna help you. Number eight, give students choices and, and then design those choices so that they result in mastery uh, of the big ideas and the key skills that students need regardless of which path they took. Uh, so this is a really important idea. Uh, you can be flexible and you don't have to teach separate lessons. It's a matter of figuring out, okay, how can I give some, it, they can, the choices can be lim, limited. You can research this or this or this, or you can write on this or this or this, or uh, you can focus on this or this, and then share what you learned. And uh, it's all focused on learning the big ideas and the key skills. So number nine, be sure if students are motivated not to demotivate them by not giving them enough time to complete because nothing kills motivation more than cutting people short when they're being productive. And then of course that's true of yourself. I mean. Give yourself a half an hour to do something, but if you're still going on it after a half hour, well, keep going if it's at all possible. But if you've had enough, well, then quit. That's fine too. So some examples are, so ask students to write for a limited amount of time. Uh, and I've seen teachers do this at the beginning of of a period and it's like they do the same thing every day if they're to practice their writing. I've seen this in high school, but you can also use it in lower grades. So it's like everybody takes out their pen and their paper and they their notebook and they write for five minutes and 
which is great because after a while it's like, oh, gee, you know, I've written 25 pages here. Well, actually you're a month into the semester. And of course, one page, a few sentences every day doesn't look like much, but if you start a new page every day, then after a while it's looks like, hey, I'm really doing something here. So if after five minutes, the students are still writing, then go ahead and let give them an extra minute. It's like, they're not watching the clock, you're watching the clock. And uh, if after four minutes, everybody's finished, they're saying, okay, well, that's good for today. Uh, and it's okay if you cut them off at four minutes or four and a half minutes. So you always wanna be flexible. And the important thing is you respond to what you're seeing. So the most important thing you can do as a teacher, as a parent, as an employer, as a presenter is watch, pay attention to the group that you're working with and see how are they responding and then adjust to that response. Even if they're not saying anything, you can tell by their nonverbals uh, what's happening. Okay. So number 10 is one of my favorites, be a coach. So um, think, I think I wish all teachers and employers and parents would think of themselves as a coach because what coaches do is they get a huge effort out of people uh, that they're working with, but it's a little bit at a time. They do something for two minutes and then they do something else for three minutes and then they do something else for five minutes. And uh, at the end of whatever the practice session, well, they've done a huge, made a huge effort, but it didn't seem like it because each thing was very short. And of course you adjust this to the age group and the skill level of the people that you're working with. So one of my favorites, with myself is, and with students is using pre-macking. And pre-macking is basically another word, this was invented called pre-macking because it was invented by uh, David Premack, who was a famous psychologist, but it's also invented by your grandmother. And it's often called grandma's rules, which it's dessert comes last. So you eat, uh, yeah, the salad first and then your main dish, and then uh, dessert comes last. So in other words, assign the difficult task first and get a start on that. And then the easier tasks feel rewarding by comparison. And uh, so the tasks that come after would feel, reward, feel like a reward because you, you did either as a person, uh, you did the hard part first. So, so you never, for yourself, you never say, well, I'll watch this show and then I'll go and do this. You, you kind of say, okay, well, I'll do, I'll work on this for half an hour and then I'll watch this show. And by doing this, by the way, uh, I taught myself to do my income taxes and have them done a month or two early instead of doing it at the last minute, which was really stressful. Uh, and I would say the first 10 or 15 years that we did income taxes, that was kind of how we did them. Because I was always putting it off uh, because I didn't use pre-macking. When I started using pre-macking, even if I only worked on it 10 or 15 minutes uh, at a time, once I got started, then I could go for longer times. And so I kind of, uh, I don't know, did I trick myself into doing this? I don't know. I just ate dessert last. I did the more fun things later. Okay, so once students are less resistant or once you're, we're less resistant to the learning the difficult skills or ideas or whatever, uh, then what we wanna do is to get ourselves and get students and others to always try to do something 
that's a little beyond what we're capable of. So we're always challenging ourselves. When you consistently give people something that's including students, something that's too easy, it's boring. <laughs> you just want to use this too easy idea to get started. And then you want to be challenging. So once the confidence is there, then you want a task that's a little beyond what we're capable of doing, a little bit what students are capable of doing or think they're capable of doing. So, so to use these, the, the thing is, is that these 12 strategies, they're all work, but as Glasser liked to say, and this is one of my favorite sayings from him, was, well, the trouble with a good idea is you have to do it. And I love that saying. Uh, what I found in working as a counselor, either with students, but also with parents, because I had a private practice as well, and I worked a lot with adults and, and, teen, and, uh, and, and kids sometimes too, but often with adults in my private practice. It's like they understood the idea, they liked the idea, but they couldn't put it into practice because they couldn't think of how to do it. They couldn't come up with a little, a little bitty detail that would be uh, allow them to put this into practice. Every idea in teaching and working with others and with ourselves has to be rethought in terms of how can I do this thing better? How can I get my income tax done? You can't, general advice, including everything I have said, is useless, just like Glasser said. It's like the trouble with a good idea is you have to use, you have to, you have to practice it. What that means is it's not a good idea, it's not good until you figure out how can I apply this. And that's what counselors do. They're not there to give advice. They're there to help the person think through, how can I do this better? And I've, I've used, I've worked with kids from kindergarten through retired teachers. And it was always this ba basic thing is trying to help them listening and then trying to figure out, okay, what's something that you could do that's simple enough that would take you in this direction that you wanna go in. So you have to analyze and reflect the specific situations where students or you aren't motivated. And it needs to be very specific and can't just be, oh, gee, I'm just not motivated to do anything or gee, my students, they're just, oh, I have the worst bunch of students. I remember when I was in grade school it was like, Every year, the teachers said the same thing, no matter what, it was a different teacher every year, but they always say, oh, you're the worst class we've ever had. It's like, gee, what's, what's wrong with my class? It's like, why are we always the worst? But then I figured out as an adult, well, they probably said that to everybody. So you need to analyze and, and reflect on those specific situations. And you have to be a really good observer as well, an observer of yourself, an observer of the students, an observer of the employees. And then you have to plan specific words, specific actions, specific ideas that you're gonna use to address the situation. And by the way, that's what reality therapy does is help the person think through using questions, what could you do about this? Uh, what could you do that has worked in the past? What could you do in the next week? All of these questions, uh, all these steps in reality therapy, they're all designed to do this, to help come up with, how can I apply whatever it is I need to apply? And in the case of the motivation, it's using the reality therapy with yourself to figure out, okay, what's going on? Where isn't the student succeeding? Where isn't the class being uh, uh, getting off track? What's going on? What can? What are some few specific things we can do? Okay, now the great thing about all of this stuff, if you start using it, 
it meets all of the basic needs, okay? So you're gonna meet belonging through using social rewards and celebrations of products and performances uh, with the students. You're gonna meet needs for power through enabling students to be competent and successful. When I helped those students to read the more Bob books, it was like all of a sudden they felt it like a total failure as a reader or in math or whatever it happened or in writing. And all of a sudden it was like, oh, well, I can do more than I thought I could. It's helping them to feel competent and successful at whatever level they are and then helping them go to the next level. It's uh, meeting the needs for freedom by giving them some choice. There's not just one way of doing things. Uh, there are different choices you can give. They can be limited to focus on the big ideas and the key skills they need to be learning. Uh, you're not getting off track. You're not taking them off the subject. You're not doing something that's irrelevant to what they're supposed to be learning. You're helping to meet needs for fun because when a task is easy enough and avoids fear, then it's much more fun to do something you can do than something you can't do. And then when you get challenging people, uh, they'll enjoy the challenge as well. Once they feel the confidence, it's like, oh, well, I can, well, let's try something now. Let me give you an example. With the, with the kids, no matter what age group they were in, and generally these were elementaries, it's like, okay, uh, let's read, some, show me something you're supposed to be reading. It's like, I would read a sentence and then they would read a sentence. And then, or, or if, they, if that wasn't a problem, I would read a short paragraph, they would read a short paragraph. But so, we, so we would take turns and that was much more fun than uh, them try to read everything by themselves. And so uh, in, we, it made it a social activity. It met their need for belonging because we were participating for, together. It met their need for competence. So you're gonna need, you're gonna meet social needs uh, by doing these things. The basic needs are so important. And so uh, that's, uh, you, you, you can, you're, you're going to be doing this as well. Okay, summary and conclusions. So the best way to learn something is to teach it. So when we teach the strategies, which we do not by presenting them, but by figuring out, okay, here's what we're going to do. And then actually you teach it through doing it, through walking the students through uh, something one step at a time. And by the way, I use this with adults. I've worked with uh, first line supervisors and um, I've, I've worked with uh, employees in a prison, I, things of that sort. And yeah, I would give them a little bit of information and then we would practice something. I would give them no more than 10 minutes of information and then we would practice. We would try something out. So you teach it, you learn it. But then also when we help ourselves, when we practice it, it makes it much easier to teach it to the students. And uh, so it's a revolving kind of thing. Do it yourself, teach it to others. They're mu mutually uh, reinforcing. So be sure to work on yourself. So the material is from uh, chapter seven of the Connect and Involve book. And uh, if you're interested, I can send you uh, a free chapter, just send, me uh, an email at see this music at icloud.com or rmartin at truman.edu, either one, and, and uh, I'll be happy to send that to you. And then there's information here on, on the book, should you be interested. Okay, well, uh, and there's some photo credits. All I, I got all of these things from Unsplash, it, and uh, they're free, unsplash.com. So if you're doing a presentation, it's a great place uh, to find some ways to make the presentation more more fun okay so that's it okay thank you robert um, i stop sharing yeah okay yeah
I could begin to, you know, we, we think in pictures. And as you were talking about action is what kind of motivates motivation, that as you begin to act as in riding a bicycle, it kind of gives you the energy then. And it brings it, it's like it, it's like the the will to do is attached to the actually doing it. And as we begin to do it. So that was that was really neat. And you're talking about if a person for whatever reason has a diminished ability that a three for them is as honorable as a five for one that has yeah like you mentioned the bicycle thing yeah. you know like the whole idea of this like i just i'm just not motivated to to exercise for a half hour 20 minutes it's like yeah fine walk out to your mail well i i i live in the middle of town but i'm I live on the edge of town and I'm very much in town, but I'm still on a rural route. So I have to walk out to my mailbox. So walk out to your mailbox, uh, walk around your, in your house, your, you, do something for five minutes, exercise, and get to where you do that every day. And you, it'll develop your motivation. So there are lots of things that we can do this with. And I really like your delving into focusing on the performance as opposed to looking at the personality of the person itself, but what they are, what they're doing and, and the performance and how it enhanced everything. Right, because we know when we praise people, it's like, oh, you're really good at this. Oh, blah, blah, blah. It's like, people actually become afraid of making mistakes. Oh, well, I'm gonna destroy my image uh, as a good person. I can't take this risk. So you always wanna focus on the performance and the product, not the person. Because most praise that focuses on the person, uh, it just, it gets in the way of people taking risks. Yeah. You want yeah. people to take risks to, to do something a little bit challenging. Yeah, yeah. Well, many times a person will not accept the compliment, will not accept the... That's true, too, yeah. 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 Whereas yeah. if you say, oh, I like the way you did this in your paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the performance, that this made the, pap that this made the paper better. And it was Another because thing, of, of you personally, yeah. Okay, well, thank you very, very much. And thank all of you for being here. We'll go ahead and close out for today. And so uh, have a good rest of the day and good mental health.